Akili companies, they are all about the Akilian culture and they know people are the most important asset. Recently, Keeley Companies entered a new chapter of their organization and underwent an entire corporate rebrand driven by the same mission and core values. Keeley Companies is a family-owned enterprise of companies across the country. They act as your single source for investment, development, management, construction, and restoration. They are still the same Keeley you know and you love. Just with a fresh, streamlined look, and new additions to the family. Who knows? And maybe you'll see the Keeley K around your time. And when you do, go on in, shake their hand, and tell them John O'Leary sent you. My friends, to learn more about the work they do and where they are, visit them online at KeeleyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire, He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired podcast with John O'Leary. Today, we're going to be talking about getting healthy. We're going to be talking about longevity. We're going to be talking about having better relationships for the single people in the house. That's right. We're going to be talking about you becoming even more attractive. We're going to be talking about better marriages. We're going to be talking about living longer. We're going to be talking about making a mighty difference through your life. All of those things. You ready for it? No, it's not diet. It's not sleeping more. It's not all the things that maybe I thought it was. What actually will contribute to the various aspects of life that I'm referring to in the introduction is generosity. It's acts of kindness. It's service. And today with us on the Live Inspired podcast, I have an expert who not only has received this kind of care and love through her life, she has modeled it, she's studied it, and she's seen the benefits of it not only for her and for those that she studied, but also in the community where kindness, where generosity, where action of love is modeled. Today we bring on Into Your Life a woman who has become a friend of mine named Ami Campbell. Ami was born in Vietnam, came over to the United States, and has built a life of meaning. And today she's going to share with you that one simple act of generosity not only touches the life of the one modeling it and the one receiving it, but ripple effects out to four additional relationships. It's a big deal, generosity is. Ami Campbell is the author of Love Let Go, and she champions generosity to help others rediscover their giving selves. Today, Ami is going to share with us how generosity can free us from the grip of fear and insecurity so that we can do, be, achieve, and impact more through our lives. My friends, one of the quotes that you may hear is gratitude is the birthplace of generosity and those two things lead to freedom. So get ready to rock and roll during this conversation. I encourage you right now to grab a drink, buckle up, get your favorite Live Inspired journal and pen, take some notes and get ready to move forward in your life with my friend. Her name is Ami Campbell. Ami, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you. I'm excited to be here with you, John. Well, I am delighted to know you. I was I was doing a little bit of recon on generosity and boldness and freedom and faithfulness. Mm. Your name popped up. So then I watched and then I watched another video and then I listened to a podcast and then I bought your book and I love your story. But rather than wow. me introducing you to our audience, I thought it might be really cool for you to introduce yourself. How would you introduce mm. yourself? Uh, well, I would tell you that I'm Ami Campbell and that I am a um, passionate champion of generosity. I feel called to help people rediscover their giving selves. I think we were all created to give. And what I hope to do is to help people and organizations uh, create cultures of generosity. And that comes from a passion for uh, my faith, a passion for this world, a passion to make this earth that we inhabit together um, a better place for each other and our children. And I also have a 
wonderful husband, two kids that are now adults, it seems crazy to me, that inspire me every day. Like I said, I'm thrilled to be here talking with you because you are um, someone I, who I think is uh, combines resilience with hopefulness, and uh, that's, that's fantastic, and we need more of that in the world, too. Mm. Well, I, I believe we can only model what we've received. And so if, if O'Leary models uh, hope and resiliency, it's because I got an awful lot of it as a kid. And so I, I want to pivot away from what I received as a kid to what you did. So I think your backstory is really fascinating. Yeah. I, I, with what you're doing today, it almost surprises me. And then again, maybe it should not on where you came from. So let's talk about mm. that. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, take Highway 55 South for about five hours and you'll see yeah. me. <laughs> you grew up in a very different part of the world. Talk about your childhood. Yeah, so I was born actually in Saigon during the Vietnam War. And my father was, he had been part of the Air Force. And then uh, when he was done serving, he was a contractor. And he met my mother while stationed there. I was born in Saigon, like I said, during the war, and lived there for the first year of my life. What's stunning to me, and my dad would be the first to admit this, John, so I'm not, you know, throwing him under the bus, but he would tell you that he was a um, troublemaker with mm. a capital T. And that's why, that's why his mother said, you need to go to the military side. What's stunning to me to this day is that he was not one of the many servicemen or contractors that that fathered children and left them there. Um, we know factually that at least 21,000 and probably many thousands more children were um, left behind after the war. And we know that because more than a decade later, when the government allowed children of American fathers and Vietnamese mothers special immigration status, that 21,000 moved to the U.S., you know, I can only uh, attribute it to divine intervention. My father decided to marry my mother, which is like the first miracle of my life that, you know, I obviously had nothing to do with. And that, that's sort of a key theme that you'll hear from me, John, is that gifts that have been given to me that I did nothing to earn or deserve. So that was the first one that my father married my mother. And then when I was a, a little over one, then moved us to the United States. Um, and I grew up in the Chicagoland area, but it wasn't until many years later that it sort of really hit me how huge a gift that was. You know, I knew it, it was told to me, but I think I didn't appreciate it until much later in my life, how big a gift it was for me to be uh, essentially airlifted out of poverty. Yeah, I'm sure you've heard the term the birth lottery where it's just by chance that you're born in this country as opposed to, you know, South Sudan or con a conflict area in Afghanistan. By all rights, I should have lost the birth lottery. Yeah. Um, I really should have been a illegitimate child born in Saigon doing, you know, farming a rice paddy, but I wasn't. I, I was given this enormous gift when I, you, you're using words like Saigon and airlifted, and I'm lucky and fortunate and blessed my father married my mother and took me out of that place. The, the first time my mom and dad took me out of St. Louis, just as a mother, father, son, was on a very special trip to New York. And, and I hadn't thought about this until I heard you answer the question. And then they took me to a little place called Broadway. And they took mm. me to a, 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 a theater that was playing Miss Saigon. Wow. And I had, uh, I'd never cried publicly before, but there was a song called Pui Doi. And uh, it's about a, a man singing about the children, the dust of life conceived in hell and born in strife. Mm. And it's this powerful song about all these little ones that we, and we are part of that, we left behind. And you were almost part of that. Yeah. But your mother and father brought you home and you come to Chicago. And I understand that life wasn't always easy for you as a little kid. Would you, would you talk also about growing up in Chicago? Yeah, my parents ended up getting a divorce when I was about eight years old. And this was very unusual at the time, but my dad actually got custody of us. I, you know, spent most of my youth in a single parent household, which meant I was, you know, the, the, tip, the prototypical latchkey kid, 
you know, getting myself and my sister up for breakfast in the morning, getting us to the bus stop, all that. So very early on, uh, you know, I think I was 14 when I got my first job at a Brown's chicken, being a cashier. And so I, I worked, you know, 15, 20 hours a week and, you know, and was a, a very diligent student. I was a busy, uh, busy and ambitious young woman. <laughs> um, I, I knew from a very, I think I was in second grade when, uh, you know, when they, when they ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I either want to be president or I want to be running an office somewhere. I think one, one of the things that my, my father did instill in me from a very young age is, and I think it's because he lacked this, is that education was really important. I knew from, I can't even remember how young I was, but I knew from a very young age that I was going to be the first one in my family to go to college. I knew that because that's kind of what, what I was told, you know, mm. that, 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 that was really important. So that was part of my motivation for working hard, uh, both in school and outside of school to be able to go to a college and be able to afford going to a college. And I was really blessed. I, I was able to attend, um, an institution that I dearly love, Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, which is a women's college. But that was a huge blessing to me uh, to be able to to go to school after all the work. My my youth, I feel like, was a lot of effort and hard work. But I also was very fortunate and got to uh, you know see the fruits of my labor. So you go off to school first one from your family to go and to graduate. What was your degree? I double majored in economics and English. So you showed off. Okay. So I'm going to move right to that question. And you're about to show off even more when you get your master's. Share where you went to school for that. And what, what was the goal coming out of that school? What was yeah. your desire, your dream? Yeah. I attended Harvard Business School and coming out of undergrad, I went into consulting, which is not a field that I even understood existed. But what I learned very quickly in consulting is that consulting is pattern recognition and problem solving. I was an economics and English major. So you can tell that I have both an analytical piece of me as well as kind of a literary piece to me. So consulting was a great fit. It required communication skills, analytical skills. When I went to business school, my goal was to actually, I felt like what I was really missing, um, I had a lot of the raw skills. I, I did not understand the language of business at all. I felt like often it was, it was as if people were speaking a foreign language around me and I wanted the facility of the language uh, more than anything. Working in Boston, everybody wants to go to Harvard <laughs> because the campus is awesome. <laughs> Uh, would be one reason. And that's where my network was too. Uh, and so my, my hope was that I would learn the language of business. You know, I was very willing to go back into consulting, but I was also, I also thought it might just sort of open some doors to some other areas as well. You graduate, which is in and of itself a, a remarkable accomplishment. You get this job, you get the signing bonus, and that's going to be something that, that you think about as you progress through your life, because what you did with it then is not what you would have possibly done with part of it today. And so I, I want to speed the tape just a little bit forward yeah. and talk about a trip, I believe, to Tanzania. Yeah. There are many inflection points in your life that help shape the arc of that life. But this trip, to me, sounds like one that radically shaped you. Talk about that trip. Absolutely. It was a huge inflection point where my generosity story pivots. It was in 2008, October 2008, that I made my first trip to Tanzania. And we had started sponsoring a child a year prior to that through World Vision. And, and that was part of our church. Our church, I think almost 100 people ended up sponsoring a child each. And then as a church, we were pooling resources to help build teachers housing for uh, a school. So in 2008, I was part of the team that went. And I was so excited for a lot of reasons, but I was so excited to meet this girl that we had started sponsoring. So we meet at, in this um, uh, community center and I spy her and I spy her mother and I'm so excited to meet them. And we each then break off and we get to be with our sponsored child and, and their mother. And 
we have a translator who's who's working with us and I, i'm I, you know of course i'm this girl is darling she's <laughs> sweet as can be but i find myself magnetized by her mother i just cannot stop looking at her and i'm asking questions and the translators translating and i'm learning about her life and i'm she had actually walked in a little late so i was learning what what it took for her to actually get there that mm. day which what which was what they walked i think it was 4 miles to catch a bus that then took them another 6 miles like no wonder you were late right it, it, and she's with a 4 year old child doing this and she's got children at home so i'm learning more and more about her the the girl that we had sponsored was her third child uh, and she was my age her oldest and i had little bitty kids right her oldest had already born her own child. So I'm seeing this and this her story sort of spooling out. And I'm realizing this woman is working all day long, taking care of these kids. She's working their farm. She lives in a essentially a one room hut with a mud thatch roof. And she's taken this time to come see me. And I'm looking at her and it just hit me, John. Like I was, I felt like I was looking in a mirror and I was like, this is the life I should have been leading. This is who I'm supposed to be. And by the grace of God, I'm not. By the grace of God, I am not in her shoes. In that realization, it's it still, it, uh, it's very, it's even hard now for me to tell that story just because it's still it just hits me coming back from that trip just convicted me in a way nothing else I think could have to start to see everything I had everything I had as a gift and that it was all shareable Mm. that I needed to to not see you know yes I worked hard right yes I did I studied I labored I did all that it's not mine. It's not mine. It is all a gift. All of that from day one was a gift. And if I don't see it that way and I don't share it, then shame on me. Um, then I have not, I have not processed, I have not recognized what I've been given. That is pr- profound. So this is 08. You have an opportunity right. when you land back in the States to begin implementing this idea of radical generosity of recognizing everything is a gift and intended to be shared but but six years later corporately as a church you have this unbelievable really once in a lifetime chance to model this i'd never heard this story before i'm not i don't live in the chicago area and must have missed the headlines when they made their way down to st louis at the time but would you talk about the church that you were part of the community that it's in and then the gift that you received Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love telling this story, John. Every time it, it gives me all those, you know, warm, fuzzy feelings inside. So I'm part of LaSalle Street Church, which is a non-denominational, small, small to medium-sized church in downtown Chicago. And LaSalle in, back in 1970, was part of the first public-private church partnership to build a a mixed income housing unit. Fast forward to 2014, that project, the the primary owners of it wanted to sell their interest and therefore LaSalle, it had invested $1,000 in 1970. The huge windfall was 1.6 million in 2014. Our our church budget at the time was like $800,000. So this is a like you said, once in a lifetime. So then the the big question is, how do we spend this money? How do we be good stewards? I'll be the first to admit there was conflict around this, right? You, you could imagine, right? Money causes a lot of marriages to break up. You know, money can cause churches to break up too. There was a lot of conflict, but one of the ideas that the leadership rallied around pretty quickly was uh, where the, our book title comes from, this Love Let Go campaign which was tithing, which, you know, as, as Christians, you know, we, uh, a tithe is 10%, giving away 10% of, of your income. So that concept wasn't new, but having the church tithe to not to other organizations, but to the church itself, 
to the church members and have them go do God's work with it. It's one thing to tithe. It's another thing to tithe and then empower people to give what they've received to others in need. Like that, that's a, that's a long bridge and a pretty radical one. And one that I'm not familiar with. It's really cool. Yeah. Do you remember when that idea first came out and what the reaction from the other board leaders might have been? One of my favorite movie lines ever is, is Simba's father saying, remember who you are, right? Like, I, you, you got to love that line. So this is where I think the board remembered who LaSalle was, right? So LaSalle gave that thousand, invested that thousand dollars in that housing project back when the pastor's salary was $3,000. Like this was not a small thing for the church to do. And that was a church of 50 people who were literally hanging the utility bills on a bulletin board so folks would pay it. It was not a church of means, never been a church of means. Part of what I think the board was realizing at the time, even though there was a budget shortfall, we were losing access to our, our, our very subsidized parking lot that we were using. There were definitely other, and we had a mortgage of, guess what, $1.6 million on our community center building. So there were definitely other Needs. very pragmatic right, needs and, and ways to spend that money. But I think what our leadership recognized is that this is a church that's never really had hierarchy, that's always been lay person driven, that has always been around collaboration and community and empowerment. And we wanted to keep, you know, living by that DNA and say, we could go tie that, you know, 160,000 to various organizations that totally. we support. But why would we do that when we have 300 members who all have different gifts that they've been given and causes that, that God's called them to serve? So let's give them all $500 checks and just give them the simple instruction, go do God's work with it. A lot of times when you're about to give someone else a gift, it's almost like, I just, I just want to do this right now. I'm so fired up to give this thing away, whatever the thing is. You know that you've got 319 friends and some of their families about to show up for Sunday service, having no clue what's about to happen. What, what is the emotion that you're feeling as you're getting ready to walk into church that day? Certainly anticipation, right? And honestly, John, I think in this, this we heard this from other people as sort of the news got absorbed, is that there's this anticipation feels like too weak a word for it, but you know God's going to do something with this, right? You know God's going to do some amazing things for the world with this 1.6 million, but more so with you, with you, because you're going to change. You're going to change in the process of giving. Our church is going to change in the process of giving. We're going to love each other better because we've given together. We are going to hear each other better because we've given. And so I think the emotion is, it is, there's some giddiness to it, right? Like you're giddy about being able to give this gift. You're also scared to death. The upside of a democratic church is that everybody has a voice. The downside of a democratic church is that everybody has a voice, right? So, right. so, so you know, somebody's going to be like, why are we doing this? <laughs> and what, doesn't the church, does the church not know how to spend its money? The response was overwhelmingly positive. People in tears, people just moved beyond words, really, with being trusted with that kind yeah. of gift and being so grateful. And that, I think you would probably agree, John, that gratitude is the birthplace of generosity. That's the overwhelming feeling that people had. Gratitude yeah. to the church for the gift gratitude for the church of 40 years before for its investment and its care for the community, you know, gratitude to God for, for this opportunity and what God was going to do with not just the money, but with our congregation. I do believe that generosity always starts with gratitude. And that was certainly the emotion of that morning. So everyone gets $500 to give to others. Please hear that loud and clear community listening to my voice today to give to others, to make a difference. You in the book and in part of your presentations I've heard share many of the stories of how some of your fellow community members gave that money away, how they invested 
might even be a better term, how they invested that money in others. David, one of your colleagues, oh, took a whole yeah. lot of people out for coffee. And the idea of their the idea was not just to serve coffee to fill a stomach, but to build relationship. I thought that was really yes. cool. A guy yeah. named Dan walked around and gave away $20 bills yeah. to those in need. Sometimes yeah. having doors shut in his face before he knocked again and explained, I want nothing other than to yeah. give. And some of the tears that came out of those. But I wanted to ask you about one of those. Yeah. What did yeah. Christopher Jacob do with his $500? He is a an artist. Photography is really his primary form of art. He started to work with the correctional system in Illinois. And I, I don't know how much you know about the Cook County jail system. You know, it certainly receives press in an, yes. in an infamous sort of way. It's not only a correctional institution, it is the largest mental health facility in the state of Illinois. What he firmly believed as an artist is that art heals, that it heals your, your spirit, it heals your soul. Uh, and so he would go to the facility and he would teach relatively small groups of men photography skills. What I love about that story and that I think also is such an important part of generosity is that he saw them as human beings, right? He's a photographer who looks at people, who really looks at people and he saw them as human beings. And then what he did for them was allow them to see each other and themselves as human beings. So they would take pictures of each other. They would try to do selfies. They got to see themselves in the way that he saw them. Not as, you know, somebody in a uniform who's in the joint for some horrific thing that they did, right? That he right. saw them as human beings with potential to create art and they could see themselves in that way. And that is what's so powerful to me. And that's one of the things that generosity does, and I think it does it whether you're a Christian or not, is it, it takes you outside of yourself and gives you a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. it, it shifts your point of view where you can see a bigger picture. You can start to process the world differently. But I think it's true whether you worship God or nothing, right? Uh, is that you can see the world outside of your little box, your little frame, and, uh, and that's part of why I love Christopher Jacob's story. And I understand he dressed them all in sport coats that he bought yes. and brought for them. So these yes. mostly men would no longer have to see themselves in these orange jumpsuits with numbers on right. the front of them, but instead see themselves, as you mentioned, as worthy human yes. beings. Then, right. then you also wrote about a fellow named Stephen Martin, who lived outside under a highway system for more than 10 years, was a yes. congregant of yours, received yes. $500, could have spent that on his needs, and they were real. His needs were Absolutely. Real. How did Stephen Martin spend his? Such a good story. He went back to the viaduct where all his homeless buddies were that he had lived with, and he rounded them up, and he said, we're going out. And they went to what he called a real restaurant and they had a meal and then he took them to the movies and he just said, I knew what it felt like. I knew what it felt like when somebody saw me and gave me food or, or did something for me. And I just wanted to be that guy. I wanted to do that for my friends. And he said, you know, for one day, they just felt like themselves. They just felt like real people. And you're right. He had enormous needs. I mean, he had health needs, he had medical needs, but he was open-handed with it. And that's part of what I think was the beauty of that campaign is that when you have $500 land in your lap, it feels like a gift, right? Mm -hmm. But then if you take out your wallet and you see 20 bucks in there, you start to see that is a gift too, right? Like, is that $20 any different from that $500? Really? Is it really any different? And so I think that's why Stephen and others could be so open-handed uh, is they could, they just started to see everything as a gift. Mm. This story begins to go viral, both through social media and mainstream media. Sometimes they both cover positive stories. Yours is one of them. There's a church Northwest of yours that hears about wow. this. And then there's two congregants who go there, who reach out to their pastor, say, Hey, we want to do something similar. We, we want to cut a check for $50,000 quietly and then have our community distribute this. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit, ask you around yeah. a couple of buzzwords you use and then drop a few of your quotes back to you. Social contagion, 
What is yes. social contagion? Why does it matter? It is a phenomenon that the, in the social contagion comes from social science research where positive behaviors can translate as well as negative behaviors, but of course our focus is on the positive behaviors. So social contagion research initially was started to study obesity and understand how obesity spreads within a community. Mm. Uh, the, and then the question was, does it translate to positive behaviors? And so one of the first behaviors studied was generosity. And what the research showed is that a single generous act ripples out four degrees of separation. So whatever you do, whatever, John, you do for your neighbor, that neighbor is going to do something for somebody else. And that person is going to do something for somebody else until a fourth person is impacted. So if you just think about that, I mean, talk about a payoff right? Like your one act ripples out to four people. And that's what social contagion is, is that you can set something in motion and you might have no idea how far it's going to reach. And yeah. that's a beautiful thing. When I'm speaking with churches, I often talk about the mustard seed because that's, it's the same concept, right? And it, the biblical mustard seed that grows into a plant that birds can perch in and nest in. It's the same thing. Like we can do one very small thing. It can be a very simple act and it may have ripples beyond what we could ever imagine. So awesome. I love the idea of four degrees of impact by yes. planting that simple mustard seed of gratitude and generosity. Yes. So those two words now drawn together, I'm going to start sharing a few of your quotes from the book back to you. Okay. <laughs> and we've whispered about this one already, but I think you can roar it out even more clearly. So here comes the first quote, brain scans. Brain scans show that activating the gratitude side of our brain fires up the generosity side of our brain and vice versa. You write gratitude and generosity then work in tandem. Talk about that, that tandemness. It's a virtuous cycle. So we talk about the virtue of social contagion. This is definitely a virtuous cycle between gratitude and generosity. Like I said, gratitude is the birthplace of generosity. I firmly believe that we give because we feel grateful for what we've been given. And then when we give, right, that it fires up the dopamine, the oxytocin, it fires up all these chemicals and it feeds our soul. There's this energizing force that generosity creates. You feel that and guess what? You feel great. Right. And then you feel grateful that you're feeling great <laughs> and you wanna give some more. It's not only biological obviously, but it's also emotional. I mean, I think we all know that feeling and we don't need to feel guilty about it. This is like a huge message that I wanna give people. Like. It feels really good to give and don't feel bad that it feels good to give. You are meant to give when, when we flourish because we're doing what we're meant to do. We were created to be givers. When we act on that impulse, we will thrive. So keep doing it. Don't feel guilty about having that sort of awesome feeling. It's okay. I want you to have more of that. I mean, thank you for freeing us to be generous. That's awesome. And I think there's a benefit to it. I think the next quote speaks to that benefit. You write that our realism, our pragmatism, and our rootedness in the visible handicap our ability to grasp the bigger picture. And then you say, concentrating only on the reflection in the mirror, we dismiss everything outside that frame. How does gratitude and generosity help us think beyond that frame of reference? To me, the biggest barrier to generosity, John, and I'm sure you've encountered this in your life, I certainly have in mine, is scarcity, is believing in a world of scarcity. And when you buy into the scarcity argument, and remember, I, I, I went to Harvard Business School. I was an economics major. I, I have talked, talked scarcity for a lot of years, right? Um, when you buy into that, it is really hard to see past it, really mm. hard. And every single message we receive uh, from the news, from social media, from uh, our bank accounts, you know, everything is telling us, you know, things are scarce out there. It's pretty tough. Hold on to what you got. Don't want to lose it. Be it's really protective. Yeah, exactly. So when every message is like that, it takes a lot 
to see beyond it. Mm -hmm. And yet we live in a world of abundance. We know we, uh, it exists, it's out there. We have the means to make this world a wonderful place for everyone to live, mm -hmm. but we just can't see it. And that's what generosity gives us a chance to do. So when we give, we recognize that we, oh my gosh, I had something to give. Yeah. And that means that I probably have something else to give. Like I had more than I needed. And that's the beauty of generosity is it takes us out of that mindset of scarcity into a place of abundance. And when we could start to, and then we, I, I do think it helps us then see it in other places. So if you give a little bit of your money and you realize that you had some spare to give, you might then realize, you know what? I actually have a spare couple hours this weekend and maybe I can go do something for my local uh, community with those spare couple hours. Or I've got a really nice network of followers on my, uh, you know, on my Facebook account. What if I promoted this cause that I care about? Like I can do that. You know, you start to see places where you can give freely. And I, I don't know if you know the writer Anne Lamott, but she talks okay. about whenever she feels scarcity, she gives something away. And that's the, that is the antidote. You just give something away. Perfect. This is actually not your quote. It's from someone you quoted within the book, but here we go. For me, she says, generosity is about letting go of all that I'm holding on to. Sure, part of that's money, but it's also all the illusions that I hold on to as well. So can you discuss for us the, the tie, the connection between generosity and freedom? Uh, scarcity traps us, right? It traps us into a mindset. It traps us into actions that aren't good for us. They just aren't good for us. Generosity allows us to escape that mindset. And once we escape the mindset, then we're a lot freer to give of our time, our, our energy, our money, everything that we have. I used to say if, if consumerism is the um, disease, then the only cure is, is generosity. I think the only way you escape, escape all the cultural barrage of messages that we get around scarcity, around consumption, is by giving. Mm -hmm. And it's when we give that we feel freer. We sense that abundance in a visceral way. We sense the abundance of the world in a truly felt way. And that enables us to be free with everything that we have. Because I do think once you, once you see everything as a gift, yeah, it's so easy to be open-handed, John, right? Because it was a gift. Of course I could pass it on. Like no problem. It, and so that's, that's where I think generosity unlocks this freedom that we all desperately need. And I think the world desperately needs. And I, I just yearn for that. I yearn for that for individuals. I yearn for that um, for all of us corporately. I yearn for that for our planet. Um, that if we could just be a little bit more generous, we would find ourselves freer and uh, kinder and and more hopeful, and we would all be living more inspired lives. Mm -hmm. Well, what a great way to pivot to the Live Inspired Seven. They are seven questions that tether all of our guests together. So, Ami, yeah. question number one, what has been the most influential book that you've read? It could have been something very recent or something from your childhood, but the most yeah. influential book in your life. The obvious answer is the Bible, because I do read the Bible daily, um, and it influences everything I do. The other nonfiction book that has really influenced me is um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. What, what he does is he goes through all the, the way our brains work, uh, and he talks about all these heuristics and these patterns that our brains develop that really are not good for us. They're not good for slow thinking, for slow processing. And they're really good for certain things, keeping us out of danger, but what they but they prevent us from really seeing and understanding ourselves and each other. And so uh, thinking fast and slow, uh, you know, af after the Bible, which is hands down the most influential book of my life, um, thinking fast and slow is, it, that's the other one that's always uh, close at hand. Awesome. I have not heard of it. We'll check it out. 
What, what is one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little girl growing up that you wish you modeled as brilliantly today? Okay. So this is like completely frivolous, but I, it, you know, maybe it speaks to something bigger. I hope it does. I loved performing as a kid. I loved that. And then I just kind of stopped doing it as I, as I got older. And it's so funny because I went to um, my college reunion just a couple months ago and we had a dance party and I was, I had the time of my life. And I realized that there's something about the physical expression of your body that just gives me a joy that, uh, that I just don't experience other ways. So I am committed to like incorporating more dance into my life because, um, uh, there is something there. There is, there is, it's a different kind of freedom. I think John, that, that I felt as a kid, I felt a freedom with just movement that I, I, you know, and feel like I'm rediscovering now at age 51. <laughs> I'm glad. If your home caught fire and all living things, your children, your family, everybody's out, all the animals are out and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item that matters to you. What would you grab? There's a couple of things that come to mind. One is my stepmother got me Mama Day was uh, by uh, Gloria Naylor was my favorite book in college. And so she somehow my stepmother somehow managed to get Gloria Naylor to autograph a co my copy, the copy that I had read. I don't even know how my stepmother even got a hold of it because I was away at college. Right. But somehow she got a hold of my book, sent it to Gloria Naylor, got her to write a transcribe it with a special 21st birthday message to me. So that means a lot to me for a lot of reasons. You know, my stepmother is, is a, a dear, dear woman. Gloria Naylor died recently, you know, last year, I think it was, you know, I told you I was an English major and African-American literature was my focus and, and she's an African-American artist. And so right now that also feels really important to me. So for a lot of reasons. We have a lot of different photo albums, but the photo album of my family's first trip to Tanzania, I came home from that trip and I scrapped the only time in my life I've scrapped book, John. And so I've got really important stories to me in there and pictures and people who matter. Um, and that's probably the other thing. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. If you could sit on a bench with anyone on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation oh. with anyone living or deceased, who do you want to be seated right next to? It would be my my grandmother who passed away. So my father's mother, um, who was the biggest Cubs fan in the world. I was spent many summers with her because my father, when when he came back from Vietnam, he was in the reserves. And so he would have to travel usually to some far off country for several weeks at a time every summer. And so we would stay with my grandmother and my grandmother she taught me about the Cubs. She taught me how to score. She taught me how to sew. We used to make my doll clothes and she baked bread. She taught me how to fry an egg. Like she just taught me so many things. And she loved me more unconditionally, I think, than anyone ever in my life. And she had lived a tough, tough life. This was a tough lady. She was also the tenderest person. I would love to just thank her for that. I don't ever feel like I got to really thank her for how much she loved me and how I felt it, how I just felt it so powerfully. She was really a dear. Well, she uh, hopefully was thanked in 2016 when those darn Cubs won the World Series. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What is, the, what is the best advice grandma or Harry Carey or anybody else has ever given you? So the best <laughs> advice Tommy, that you've ever received is? I have an opinion. Interestingly, the context of that was a, a woman, she was one of my first bosses in the consulting world. And she was saying it because at the time, the consulting world was, you know, I think we were 20% female. And she said, you know, if you're going to survive this business, you need to have an opinion. As I have grown older, I realized that it's less about having the opinion. It's knowing what you believe. Yeah. It's, it's knowing yourself and your values and who you are and whose you are and knowing that. Great advice. Two more questions left. What, what yes. advice would you whisper into your ear at age 20? If you could go back in time and give yourself a little oh, hug, take the rear end and a little bit of encouragement, yeah. what would you say to yourself? At age 20, I told you, I was, 
I was ambitious and I was really focused on success, whatever that meant. And I would probably just tell myself to, you know, relax a little bit. Don't take yourself so seriously. I'm a Campbell, my friend. It has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your oh. one sentence to read? Hmm. She gave, she loved, she made a difference. I, I hope, I hope that all those are true. <laughs> I mean, you did give, you certainly did love, you certainly did make a difference. I think you also let go. And I'm grateful uh, that you made time for us today to remind us not only what you've accomplished through your life, but what we can accomplish through our lives. Gratitude leads to generosity, leads to freedom, and the cycle virtuously benefits itself going forward. It's a big deal. And uh, you're a great voice in that world. Thank you for being part of our conversation today. My friends, that is Ami Campbell. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. Well, my friends, I told you on the front side that you were going to love this conversation. I have every belief right now that you did. I also shared with you a quote from Ami at the beginning of the introduction. She shared it midway through, and I'm going to share it one more time as we wrap up. Gratitude is the birthplace of generosity. And generosity leads to freedom. When I think of generosity and gratitude and freedom, there are two other podcasts that come to mind, guests that we've had on that I loved, I love, and I know you will too when you check them out. The first is Patricia Heaton. She was phenomenal. She's an amazing human being, a great leader, great actress, and a great humanitarian. You can learn more about her on the Live Inspired Podcast Network. She's remarkable, but you can also learn more about one of my friends, a guy who mentored me early on in my business and a man who generously sponsors this podcast, along with many, 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 many bits of outreach and philanthropy that he does. His name is Rusty Keeley. Those are two amazing guests that you can learn about by visiting me right now at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. So for this time, And until next time, I want to remind you that gratitude leads to generosity. Generosity leads to freedom. So today, be generous in the way that you show up in life for this time. And until next time, this is John O'Leary. Today is your day. What a gift. Live inspired. One thing I love most about my friends at Keeley Companies is their spirit and their passion for giving back to their communities across the nation. Keeley Companies was recently named a top corporate philanthropist by the St. Louis Business Journal, and I could not think of a more deserving organization to receive that honor. In 2021 alone, the Keeley Cares Foundation served countless people in need, donated more than $2 million, and served for more than 20,000 hours. On top of that, They added an astounding 13 new charities to their ever-growing wall of compassion. Here at the Live Inspired Podcast, we are proud to partner with Keeley Cares throughout the year, improving our communities with time, with talent, and with treasure. You can learn more about their unbelievable impact by visiting them online at keeleycompanies.com.